you, you have to move forward. I mean, you get, we were, at, there were many times where I, you know, I couldn't just stop crying. It, right. the, you know, and I'm, I'm doing whatever I need to do, but the tears are coming down my face. Um, but you, how do you maintain your sense of self? And that's really it. You know, and I say that, I say that in the context of even mm -hmm. with life and death happening all around you, yeah. you know, where, where do you find your call to action? That's, it finds you. It does. It comes right up and it finds you and it says, uh, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to keep going through this. I'm not going to stop loving my husband. I'm not going to walk out the door and leave him. Um, I'm not going to walk away from my children. I'm not going to lock myself in the room. Um, it, it just comes up from inside you. So, you so then your through. husband says, you're going through this. You're dealing with uh, his diagnosis and, and uh, hoped for treatment. And then, mm -hmm. and then he says, oh, they've asked me to come and do, you, you moved, right? Had you moved down to Virginia? You moved away from Pittsburgh? Yeah, so we had, um, so the way it had worked was Randy went through um, cancer treatment. Um, so he had the tumor cut out. He was eligible for a surgery. And, right. and um, so we, we considered that winning the lottery. Right. He was able to um, have the, the original tumor cut out. Um, and it took him several weeks to recover from the surgery. And a week later, he um, went to Houston. And I took our kids to Virginia. And my brother and sister-in-law took care of my kids um, during the weekdays uh, when I was in Houston with Randy helping him through chemo and then I'd get somebody to take care of Randy on the weekends and I would come to Virginia and pick up my kids and take care of my kids on the weekend and then I would go back and forth for two months. So you're living this, this life of back and forth and not even with your small children yeah. but he gets a call from Carnegie Mellon Carnegie to come Mellon. back and do uh, a lecture. the last lecture. It's mm -hmm. a series that various universities around the world yeah. do yes. for beloved professors to come and talk about what would you talk about if this was your last lecture? Mm -hmm. And of course, the horrible irony is that it was his last lecture. Yeah. So he tells you he wants to do this. And uh, what was your reaction? At the time, he originally had said yes to this. It was already, you know, it was summertime and the, the um, cancer hadn't come back. So it was like, yeah, well, we're here in Pittsburgh and that's fine. OK, great. Um, but then in August, we got um, the scans back, and they showed that the cancer had come back, and there was a metastasis. Um, we had already talked and decided that if, there, if the cancer were to return, that this would be our plan of action. And that included picking up and moving to Virginia. Um, and we moved in three weeks. Um, wow. So I, um, you know, here we are in Virginia, and he says, you know, I still have to give this lecture. Uh, I'm going to go back. I want you to come with me. And we've been, in, we've been in Virginia now for two weeks. Our oldest child has just started kindergarten. Oh. So there's been, you know, for two years, they've been either in a rental house, at my brother's house, back at our uh, original house in Pittsburgh, and now they're in Virginia. And, and we've only been there for two weeks. And he says, you know, come, come with me um, for, the, for the lecture. And, and I really, you know, I didn't want him to go do it. I, I felt like if we only have three months together, I don't want you away from us at all, right? not for a day. Uh, I want all this time for us, and I want all that time for our kids. But, but of course, <laughs> he did it anyway. Do we know this He's man? He's so strong, Will. <laughs> so, <laughs> he went, Yeah. and he did it. Yeah. And you actually went and were there. And I think one of the most moving things he said in the book is what you said to him that you whispered into his ear. Yeah. Please don't die. What you got? That got cut in the book. Uh, they cut that out. So. Uh, because you were so moved by what he did. Yeah. Did you know? Did you realize at the time, or did he, what would happen with this lecture? That it would become this, really, this icon, this touchstone, a touchstone for all people. <laughs> to give them an idea of how to live their life? No. Uh, well, we knew that the um, lecture was going to be videotaped, and we knew that they were going to broadcast it over the internet because um, I knew that UNC Chapel Hill was going to be playing it for um, their CS students. Um, we knew that um, I think Cornell was playing it. So there were some universities who were picking up the feed, and they were broadcasting All it over the internet. All you techno geeks were going to yeah, listen yeah, to this yeah. guy it was, talk. It was he's an academic a, was an, talk. Right, right. He was an <laughs> expert on virtual reality. Yeah, so it was just an Of course, talk. it was a dose 
of reality, wasn't it? Well, and, and, it, and probably um, I haven't I haven't seen a lot of last lectures, but uh, you know the professor probably isn't going to concentrate uh, on their research so much as talk about the pearls of wisdom that they have to pass on to their students. Right. Um, so it's it's a broader topic than that. So we we knew that it was going to be broadcast via the internet. What we didn't know was that um, it was going to get loose, get posted on YouTube, and then become this, this viral sensation that would lead to all sorts of uh, media attention, and then that would lead to a book offer. So it why, just kind of grew, do you grew, think, grew. Why do you think uh, it's resonated so much with the public? Well, I think that um, there, I think that there are some, well, I think it's a misnomer that people, that we're the only people who go through things like this. Like, you know, we're the only people who have tragedy. I think everybody experiences tragedy in their lives. And I think that Randy comes across as being very plain spoken, um, very concrete. Um, and it's just, uh, I, I think that because he doesn't feel sorry for himself and he says, here are some strategies, this is what I have learned, this is what I have passed on. I think that it's, um, it's just something that people can look at and say, yeah, I, I, I feel the same way or they agree with. And it touches something that they feel inside themselves as well. So I have to ask you, do you think that the last lecture for your children is an incredible legacy? I mean, you, you now have to live, and mm -hmm. you're just a person, right? Now you're living with this legacy of this iconic man. And in fact, backstage, when Jay, can I share with them what you said, that you heard him? Oh, and she yeah. said, usually when I hear him now, he's in my head saying, go buy something. I'm like, that is amazing. My husband's always telling me not to buy things. Yeah. <laughs> and I he, said he changed after he died. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, he's this iconic man. Yeah. Is this legacy uh, going to be something that is wonderful for your children, or in some ways, will it be a burden to live up to? Well, and I, I think that if it's a burden for them to live up to being, uh, to being honest and not telling lies, if, if um, they're held to a standard of treating people nicely, playing well with others, right. I think this is a wonderful standard to hold them to. Right. Um, and I think Randy makes it really clear in the book and in, in the lecture that he never um, expect, he didn't expect the kids, and the message isn't to the kids that they have to go on and do a certain career path or that he expects them even to go to college, but rather to find the thing within themselves that they love and to pursue that, uh, but at the same time, that they should be good citizens, that they should give back, should, that they should be nice to other people, that these are all part and parcel, and I, I think that's a, a, I think it's going to be a good thing for them. I'll, they haven't read the book, they're too young, I haven't right. shown them the lecture at all. My 12-year-old has read the book. Really? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so he loved it. He, unlike his father, he likes to read books without the word catch in the title. So. <laughs> well, let me, have to come up with something catchier then. That's for right. <laughs> he, he loved it. I, I have to say, I, I, I'm so honored that you're here today. Oh, it really um, was, has been so wonderful to get to know you over this time. Yeah. You know, uh, a really good friend of mine passed away, and I, it was in that moment that night when she passed away very suddenly um, I thought about her husband at home alone in bed and I thought to myself I now understand what the word cherish means yeah and I I know that people are probably wondering how you're doing now and how you go on and just how your family is well, I think we're doing really well. I think so, too. <laughs> um, that's my perspective. But um, I, I think that the kids are doing really well. We're um, trying to find our own rhythm, trying to um, find uh, the, the way that our house will work, to find our own rituals. Um, the kids are moving forward, and they're taekwondo. taking taekwondo. The boys are taking taekwondo now, which is very, very cute, very exciting. And they're six, four, seven, four, seven, and two. Seven, four, and Chloe will be three in May, so okay. she's a little over two and a half. Um, so you know, they're they're doing really well. Um, they've had many, many questions about Randy and about his death, and that's something that um, I always talk with them about. Right. And uh, it's it's uh, it's not that we don't talk about Daddy. Um, I try to bring him up on a daily basis and in, in, in positive ways. Um, if it's something real simple like, oh, you know, this is the, the, the um, dinner that your daddy liked the best, and, uh, or, you know, whatever it is, that you sound just like your daddy. That's something your daddy would say. Right. Um, so that he, at least his, his spirit and his memory stays alive with us. And He's a person, not 
the man on the video screen. Right? Yes, That's important. yes. Well, and and like any, you know, uh, what you saw on the video screen is real. Absolutely. Um, but there are many facets to a personality, so um, it's not like that's a fake Randy, but it's just one part of Randy. And 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 so hopefully, um, as they grow up, you know, they'll learn from their aunt and his and Randy's friends all the other parts, of his silly ah, parts, the and seamy <laughs> underside, the, the, you know, the yeah. other parts of Randy. The other parts. So. so um, I, I want to ask you, um, because the book is about dreams, and mm -hmm. I am all about following your dreams. It's something that I lecture about and I think is important, and I think that's one of the reasons this resonated. Will you share with everyone your dream right now? Oh, well, I, um, I'm really focused right now on um, trying to uh, find a direction for the kids and for our life, and that, that takes up a lot of my thoughts. Um, I'm hoping that when my kids are in school that I'll be able to do some volunteer work. Um, one of the things that was really uh, helpful to me was um, when we would be in the cancer wards, um, there, there would be this, they call it the jolly trolley. <laughs> It's like this little cart, this little tea cart that they push around and they just offer um, folks who are literally, you get, you get stuck in these cancer um, chemo areas and you know, you're, you're, my spouse in my, in my case is getting chemo and he doesn't want anything to eat or drink and you know, he's, you know, but you're stuck there for hours at a time. So you know, one of the things that they would offer me is a sandwich or just something to drink and um, it was just a, just a small act of kindness and I, would, and I think, well, that's something that I might be able to do, um, especially in the next couple of years when, I've, when I have a little more time and the kids are in school and that's something I could um, do as a way t to start giving back and that would be nice. When you said that to me and you told me that, I was so moved because, <laughs> you know, it's not always about big dreams. Yeah. Talk about providing perspective. It's about making a difference one person at a time. And I think today with sharing your story, uh, I, I am so honored that you're here today and showing people uh, who you are and uh, how you are today, I think that you've inspired us all. I want to thank you, well, Jay. Thank you so much. Being. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put my shoes back on. Oh, look. <laughs> oh. That's for you. <laughs> That's why you don't so, take shoes off. I invite you uh, to join us in one of our breakouts. Jay, thank you, Jay. And Amina Slawi, our Spouse Award winner, will be sharing a breakout discussion that I'll be facilitating about overcoming adversity this afternoon. We're very lucky that Jay was able to join us. Well, I want to thank you, everyone, for coming to our first ever Spouse Experience Summit. I would like to welcome back to the stage my incredible co-chairs. They are an amazing team. They made this happen. Thank you.